The Battle of Rossbach is one of the most epic battles in all of history. It's one of the cornerstones for Prussian military culture, and amazingly one-sided, which makes it more interesting. At first glance, all of me looked like it's a huge untrained mob getting destroyed by the world's most efficient killing machine. But in this video, I'll go into the finer details of the battle and show you what really went down. And maybe convince you that the French and Imperials weren't actually trying to lose on purpose, no matter how much the end result looks like it. I've actually split the battle into two videos, because no one wants to listen to me ramble for 20 minutes, not even I do. And plus, I actually get more total views that way. So the first part deals with the preliminary maneuvers and who's fighting who, while the second part is going to explain the battle and you get to watch all the animated squares blow each other up. So the battle takes place in the Seven Years War, which was basically Prussia and England against everybody else. So far it's been going pretty bad for Prussia, which is being attacked on all sides by Austria, Sweden, France, Russia, and the Holy Roman Empire. The Prussian army is pretty much split up to meet all of these threats, but King Frederick the Great has taken his main army to attack France and the Holy Roman Empire, and at least maybe take care of one problem. So first, we'll start off with the army of the Holy Roman Empire, commanded by Prince Joseph of Saxe-Hildburghausen. The Imperial Army, which was called the Reich's Execution Army, was made up of soldiers from the different states of the Holy Roman Empire, which itself was an absolute mess of 231 states and territories. Each different principality or state was required to contribute a bunch of soldiers whenever the Empire went to war, and in theory, provide a total of 40,000 men. But of course, it didn't work like that. While the Reich's army did include a number of quality Austrian units, not including those, everything else was pretty much just a mob. Each group of soldiers had their own different training practices, that is, if they were trained at all. Many of the cavalry hadn't even ridden on a horse prior to the start of the Rossbach campaign, and some of the less hopeless soldiers, such as those from Württemberg, were Protestant, which meant that they tended to sympathize with the Prussians, who were supposed to be their enemies. I mean, I get that soldiers don't necessarily have to hate the enemy, but at least make sure, I don't know, they don't just run off and join the other side. And that wasn't the only problem. There was no organizational staff above the battalion level, the soldiers were poorly trained, the supply system was dysfunctional, and there was pretty much no unit cohesion between the troops of the various contingents, who only had a few months to train together. The only good thing may have been that Sachs Hildburghausen was more than well aware of all these deficiencies and tried his best to make things better by keeping his entire army out of combat, knowing that they would disintegrate in battle. Next, we have the French army, commanded by Charles de Rohan, Prince of Subis. The French army wasn't as bad as the Reich's army, but the best troops of the army were in North America or fighting in Hanover under the Duke of Richelieu, leaving Subis with whoever was left. Subis himself was only commander not because he was a good general, but because he had friends in all the right places. The average French soldier was of good quality, but those in Subis' army tended to be lazier and less disciplined than the best French troops and had practically no combat experience. Additionally, the army had around 30,000 camp followers, which just made things more disorganized. Overall, Subis' army wasn't great, but they were certainly much better off than the Imperials were. Going up against these jokers were the Prussians, commanded by Frederick the Great. I'm not going to go into detail about them since all you have to know is that they were very, very good soldiers. Even though they had just lost the Battle of Kolin against the Austrians, and morale may have been low, they were still the best trained army in Europe at that time. And that's all you really have to know for now. So a lot of people view Rossbach as a battle of quality vs quantity, and in that, they're not entirely wrong. The Prussians were outnumbered 2 to 1, but more than made up for that deficiency in the quality of their soldiers and their commanding officers. They numbered 16,600 infantry, 5,400 cavalry, and 79 cannons for a total of 21,000 men. The French and Imperials numbered 34,000 infantry, 7,300 cavalry, and 114 cannons. For a total of 41,000, the Austrian and German Reichsarmee making up 11,000 of that total. We begin our tale on November 3, 1757. The Prussians are encamped between the Giesel River and the town of Bronsdorf, 
while the French and Imperials are encamped below the town of Mushal. Both sides are unaware of the presence of the other. Zubis had positioned his army facing north, as he was expecting the Prussians to come from that direction. Before joining up with the French a few days prior, however, Hilberg Helden's men had skirmished with the Prussians, and knowing of their general dispositions, attempted to convince Zubis that the Prussians were definitely not coming from the north. The fact that his own imperial troops formed the right wing of the camp, where he believed the Prussians could attack, made Hilberghausen very nervous, which just shows you how confident this dude was in his own men. In fact, according to Hilberghausen, the camp layout was, in his own words, the most confused thing I have ever seen in my life, as for some reason, Zubis had set up his camp headquarters in front, north of the camp where he thought the Prussians would attack from. In addition to the poor layout, the Allied troops were low on supplies because they had been loitering in the same region for a month, and had been going without regular rations for about a week. Eventually though, Subis agreed to shift the Allied position to face east after receiving reports from his scouts about enemy activity there. Meanwhile, Frederick had been busy analyzing the terrain. His scouts had discovered the Allied camp and reported that it was facing north, putting Freddy on her right flank. Now, if you know anything about warfare, being on the enemy flank is like winning a jackpot if you're a general, because you can just walk in and pretty much roll up the entire enemy army from one side. Freddy recognized this, and therefore planned to attack the next day. On the morning of November 4th, Frederick went out to scout the enemy camp himself, as he liked to do before a major assault. However, during the night, the Allies had changed the camp direction and fortified it. Freddy incorrectly estimated the Allied strength to be at 60,000, three times the size of his own army. He had been previously defeated at the Battle of Kolin as a result of a frontal assault against fortified Austrian positions, and so understandably was hesitant to pull off another human wave attack with what little men he had left. The Prussians moved up between Breda and Rosbach, putting them two and a half miles in front of the Allies and directly parallel to them. Freddy, who had set up his headquarters at Rosbach, knew that the Allied troops had been without regular rations for a week and that their shelters were pretty awful, and so by playing the waiting game, he hoped to force them to attack. Meanwhile, morale had shot up in the Allied camp when the expected Prussian attack did not materialize, many soldiers taking this as a sign of a lack of confidence by Freddy. Hilberghausen wanted to attack the Prussians, whether it was because he was confident or because he wanted to get the war over with, because his army was apt to disintegrate at any minute, we shall not know. Subis had actually received secret orders from the French government to disengage, which would have been a total backstab for Hilberghausen. Fortunately for him though, both he and Subis knew that a retreat would potentially end in disaster, especially with the Prussians only a few miles away. Also, Hilberghausen had come up with a decent enough plan and actually convinced Subis to go along with it. One of the greatest problems in the Allied army lay in its two commanding officers. Subis and Sax Hilberghausen weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, but they weren't stupid or incompetent either. The problem was that the Allied army had two commanders, both of whom had conflicting ideas and interests. Technically, Hilberghausen was a superior, but Subis had about three times as many men under his command. Throughout the campaign, both men had pretty much neglected any meaningful communication between their separate armies, and when they had joined together, their plans tended to conflict. But for the dynamic duo here, command and control should have been the least of her problems, as they're not going against some random joker, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, they're going up against the Prussian army. Hilberghausen's plan was to form up the army in three columns, march south, and then turn eastwards to make camp west of Reichartsverden, which put his whole army on the Prussian left flank. He hoped that the flanking maneuver would compromise the Prussian position, and maybe, if he kept his fingers crossed, the Prussians would retreat. If not, Hilberghausen planned to attack on November 6th. So here's a diagram of the Allied order of advance. Uh, just as a disclaimer, none of the blocks actually stand for any certain number of soldiers that are just there as a visual. And as I mentioned before, there were Austrian units included in the Reich's army. However, here none of them have been marked out except for the Sicheni Hussars in the advance guard. So the leftmost column was headed by 16 German cavalry squadrons, followed by 16 French battalions, followed by 16 French squadrons. The middle column had 17 German squadrons and 16 French battalions, while the right column had the Reichsarmee infantry and artillery and the French reserve, 
Between this column and the middle one was a French artillery. The Austrian Cheney Hussars formed the advance guard. On the morning of November 5th, the Allied army began to organize into the intended battle formation, screened by the corps of Saint Germain and Loudon, which remained behind as a reserve. It took the Allies several hours to pack up and get into formation, and even with Hildbrighausen trying to get everyone to hurry up, the French seemed to take their time, and the massive columns only began to lumber forwards at around noon. Hildbrighausen's whole plan was basically just a left turn. Unfortunately, neither the French nor the Imperials knew how to do this very well, and in the confusion formed a fourth column. At around 1 p.m., Soubise halted the army. He thought Hildbrighausen's plan was garbage and wanted to regroup the army where it was and take up position there. Hildbrighausen was disgusted with Soubise and so were the other French officers, and so they all just decided to keep going. Meanwhile, Freddy was having lunch with his friends. His scouts had reported that the Allies were on the move, but Frederick just assumed that they were retreating. Right on the floor above him, a man named Captain Gotti had noticed a number of Allied generals out scouting and the Allied army itself making its less than perfect turn. When Gotti reported this, Frederick got mad and ignored him at first because he's king and he can do whatever he wants, but eventually, someone managed to convince Frederick that the Allies were really on the attack. Once he was convinced though, Frederick went straight into action. By this time, the Prussians were almost in Hildbrighausen's trap. Instead of retreating though, Frederick improv and decided that the best option would be to reverse the trap and attack the Allies while they were still on the march. His plan was to use the Yanis Hill to hide his army as they marched to deploy at the head of the enemy columns. If the French deployed in the line while the Prussians were still maneuvering, then his forces would be conveniently clustered to attack the French right. It was around 2.30 when the Prussians began to mobilize. In stark contrast to the French, the Prussians packed up swiftly and were on the march in a matter of minutes. Count von Seydlitz would lead the maneuver with 38 squadrons of cavalry and 8 regiments, followed by the 24 battalions of infantry Frederick had, while the artillery under Captain Muller would position itself on Yanis Hill. The Allied generals had been watching all of this from their position and saw the Prussians leaving. They believed, with all their hearts, that the Prussian army was truly terrified of the French and Imperials, and were not merely trying to escape, but were in a panicked retreat. Desperate to catch the Prussians, Hildbrighausen ordered the whole army to speed up. He sent the Allied cavalry far ahead of the infantry to pursue the supposedly retreating Prussians. Now it is here I shall end the video and keep you in suspense. Will Hildbrighausen's cavalry catch up with the Prussians? Will the Prussians escape the trap? Or is the prey actually the hunter? You will get to see in part 2. Thank you for watching and remember to click like or subscribe if you enjoyed the video.